Hello and welcome to The Week in Art. I'm Ben Luke. I'm standing in St Mark's Square and that's the sound of the bells of the Campanile of St Mark. Of course, that means we're in Venice and we're here for a Venice Biennale special. We're back for the latest edition of the biggest biennial in the world of art. The Venice Biennale comprises an international exhibition featuring more than 300 artists, dozens of national pavilions in the Giardini, the gardens at the eastern end of the city, and the Arsenale, the historic shipyards of the Venetian Republic, and a host of official collateral exhibitions and other shows and interventions across Venice. We'll give you our immediate impressions of this year's event. Louisa Buck, Jane Morris and I review the main exhibition, Foreigners Everywhere, Stranieri Ovunque, curated by the Brazilian artistic director, Adriano Pedrosa. I talk to artists and curators behind five national pavilions, Geoffrey Gibson in the US Pavilion, John O'Confra in the British Pavilion, Romuald Hazume in the Benin Pavilion, Gustavo Caboca Wapichana, the curator of the Hoho Poi, or Brazilian Pavilion, and Valeria Montecolque in the Chilean Pavilion about their Presentations. And finally, we always like to end our Venice specials by responding to an example of the historic work that made the Most Serene Republic, or La Serenissima, one of the world's great centres for art. So, for this episode's Work of the Week, I gained exclusive access to one of the most significant paintings in Venetian history, the Assunta, or Assumption of the Virgin, made between 1516 and 1518 by Titian. Since the last Biennale in 2022, the Assunta has been unveiled after a four-year conservation project funded by the charity Save Venice. Venice, and I spoke to the man who restored this incomparable masterpiece, Julio Bono. We have a new subscription offer for the art newspaper. Subscribe for as little as 50p per week for digital and £1 per week for print or the equivalent in your currency. Visit theartnewspaper.com to find out more. Do also subscribe to this podcast and our sister podcast, A Brush With, wherever you're listening. The latest episode of A Brush With features a conversation with the artist showing in the Canada Pavilion in Venice, Capuani Kiwanga. Please also give us a rating or review on Apple Podcasts. Now, in February, I spoke to the artistic director of this year's Venice Biennale, Adriano Pedrosa, on this podcast, and he explained the themes, light motifs, and choice of artists behind this year's show, Foreigners Everywhere, Stranieri Ovunque. It opened to the media and professionals this week, ahead of the public opening on Saturday. I spoke to Louisa Buck, the art newspaper's contemporary art correspondent, and Jane Morris, our editor-at-large, in detail about the show, and we also picked out some of our highlights from the National Pavilions and other shows. Luisa, there are four themes which Adriano Pedrosa has been keen to stress. What are they? Well, these four themes, I mean, Adriano, the horse's mouth, he says that the fundamental theme is artists who are themselves foreigners, immigrants, expatriates, diasporic emigres, exiled or refugees. So it's rather more than three, actually, because they all interconnect. And that's very much what this Biennale is about, is overarching themes that then have sub-themes. But this sense also of these foreigners in their own land, but also foreigners who have moved from different areas. And it says here that they've actually moved between the global south South and the global north. So migration and decolonization. So you have a foreign bodies, foreigners, and geographic displacement and, and movement. Absolutely. And then Jane, there's this really crucial factor, which is that we are looking at lots of contemporary art, but there is a lot of historical work in the show. And he has these nucleos that he calls them. So tell us about the nucleos. Well, I think there's actually more dead artists in the show than there are living artists. I think it is just over half. There's an enormous number of artists as well. Bit of a debate about how many. It's either 331 or 332. However, most of the dead artists, not all, but most of them are grouped into these nucleo historicos, which are basically... I suppose they're like uh, his historic group shows. Yeah. And there's, there's three main themes. One is abstraction in the Giardini. There's also a portrait exhibition in the Giardini. And then in the Arsenale is, is an Italian diaspora show called Italians Everywhere. Right. And most of the works in the Nucleo Storico are one work by an individual artist. There's not many artists represented by more than one work in those sections. I think think they're pretty much all one work by one artist. It was interesting, though, because when I went to them, I was a bit like, is this a sort of Gesamtkunst work? You know, is the show 
the room rather, but it is like a mini museum show. Is this the work, the seeing everything as the group? So when you go into the portraiture one, um, you're seeing a sea of faces, mostly non-white. I think they are the first half of the 20th century. The abstract one, I think, is the second half of the 20th century. But you can, of course, go one by one by one and start looking at all these different styles, all these different ways of making portraits. And, you know, you do start to spot artists you like. And it is quite extraordinary because, I mean, they're on these two levels. It's over 100 portraits dating, I think, from 1909 to 1990. So, as Jane says, you have this extraordinary kind of range of portraits and suddenly, bam, you spot a Frida Kahlo with a Diego Rivera on her forehead painted. And to her right, there is a Diego Rivera, but surrounded by a whole sea of artists that you don't know from all across the globe and not the Northern America and European globes that we've all known in our traditional art worlds. Absolutely. I mean, we've seen lots of museums have been doing modernisms, Jane, re-looking at modernism, analysing modernisms from outside of the of Europe and North America, like Louise has just said. It feels like it's really exploding modernism, this show, in a single place, in a place where you've got the space to do that. Did you sense that too? Yes. I mean, I think some people have said to me, well, didn't Massimiliano Gioni do this in 2013 with his Venice Biennale, which was very much about outsiders? And there is some truth in that. Uh, in fact, a lot of truth in that. The 2017 documenta as well very similar sort of theme the fact that Adriano Pedrosa comes from Latin America I think does make a difference because I think there are far more artists here from Latin America um, Africa Asia the Middle East than I think we've ever seen in a Biennale before I mean I think with Adam Shimshik's documenta you could tell he was a European curator Massimiliano Gioni is very much transatlantic between Italy and the US I don't think we've ever seen such an amount of folk art indigenous art so much craft a whole range of things and particularly in the abstract section of the um, Nucleo Historico because you know we've so busily been imbued with our with our northern American European view of abstraction cubism and of course you have a whole Latin American and indeed African and indeed Arab and indeed Asian take on abstraction so the centre of this abstract room which I think is one of the strongest rooms actually in the Giardini yeah, uh, pavilion I, loved it. I, I really loved it and I mean you have this extraordinary you know these amazing tubular multicoloured forms and you think oh yes that's you know that's that's a nice geometric tubular form and then you see that it's actually by, by Ione Saldana from Brazil, and it's they're made from bamboo. You know, then you have the calligraphic forms, which are beautiful pieces of calligraphy, but as abstract forms. So you have this sense of very geometric um, piece, which is actually a Mexican male artist making it out of fabric and textile with a zingy pink that you sure don't see in European abstraction. So <laughs> you've got this exploding of notions of abstraction. Of course, there's a long tradition of Latin American abstraction, mm. which which Pedros is very much tapping into, but then tapping into and then moving out of. So I think this is really interesting the way that you know we see a trope we see a form and then we see it with a completely different interpretation yeah i think there is definitely a sense here of this isn't just a different sort of modernism this is saying all kinds of other art a lot of which i think has been rather denigrated in the west as primitive or naive or craft or handmade here is given center stage absolutely let's talk about the portraits room because that I feel, was a bit less successful. I agree, absolutely. The abstraction room is wonderful, it's zingy, there's wonderful conversations between artworks. And while there are very many really interesting works in the portrait section, well, I also felt there were some pretty howlerish paintings, paintings that I think were really interesting because they placed me in a position where I'm testing my own art historical training. I'm sort of thinking I would look at that and I would say that that's badly painted. And is that more the full me, you know? And I'm wondering if if, if that's part of Adriano Pedrosa's plan as well. It's it's about really upending all of the ways in which we have to interpret art and to link forms of art and to associate media and so on. It, it, it's really exploding everything, the way we look at it as well as what the actual works are. Yes, the, the portraits um, exhibition is in two rooms and it's, it's a salon style hang. So there's paintings on top of paintings. Um, and it is true that as you walk along, well, true to me, my truth <laughs> was that I walked along and thought some of these are a bit kitsch. Yeah. Some of them definitely reminded me of the sort of things people used to hang on their walls in the 1950s. But... I'm quite taken by the fact that 
Jeffrey Gibson, who is the US artist representative, who's an indigenous artist, has talked before about the fact that the idea of kitsch is a very Western art historical notion. So like you, Ben, I did find myself thinking, is this good? Is this bad? I don't know. The the sort of usual rules of judgment, the value judgments in some of these are difficult for me. And I think you probably found the same thing. But then every so often, you would see something really incredibly strong. I mean, there's this marvellous picture of a sort of monumental, um, almost like an Easter Island figure by uh, a, an artist called Juana Elena Diz, for example. And I looked at that and I just thought, oh, that is so powerful. Why have I never heard of this woman? But what was so interesting was it was monumental, it was abstracted, but the face had a really emotional, introspective view. So it was kind of imbued with the subjectivity that then went through the abstracting forms. I was also taken by Twin 77 from Nigeria. I'm a collective from 1944 to 2011, who made this this figure of female architect. And there she is sitting in a very Demoiselle d'Avignon, dare I say, pose. But of course, she'd never seen Picasso. Picasso was completely channeling that that way of interpreting the stylization of African art. But this was just like a completely pure, wonderful piece of, of, of subjective. But it was painted in oil. So obviously, they had seen some form of, of Western art as well to be able to be even using that kind of medium. So you've got this two-way street. And one also saw, I found, some quite clunky appropriation of European you know, style idioms and abstraction or even post-impressionism. But then in the same way that, you know, the Europeans rather clunkily appropriated very important African ritual artefacts that weren't meant to be looked at aesthetically at all. So I I like this two-way traffic going all the way through. I think the things that really struck me with this was, A, the amount of research that must have gone into it. Now, we know that Adriana Pedroza was drawing on previous shows he's worked on because there is no way you could have put a show together like this in the year and a half that, that you normally get. And I do think he's asking us to question our judgments and those judgments. And you could spend hours in those rooms or you could just walk straight through and go, OK, I get the concept and leave. But, but I think it's a manifesto, Biennale, this. I mean, I think, you know, he's spent, you know, Pedro has spent a very rich career as, as a director and a curator thinking about these things. And this is his chance to lay out, you know, lay out his flag, throw down the gauntlet in front of the entire art world. So you've got this idea. It's never going to be the same again now. Rather in the way that he has so-called outsider, untrained artists that come through as part of his brief, but that wouldn't have been possible that Cecilia Alemani's show beforehand. So you've got this sense of these these things coming through. I, I wanted to bring up the capsules in the last Biennale, so Cecilia Alemani's Biennale, The Milk of Dreams. It seems to me that the historic elements of this Biennale are doing something very different to that. Those seem to be there to kind of give uplift to the wider themes in the contemporary work, whereas it seems to me that there's a lot of reparation going on in terms of the artists that are included in Adriano Pedrosa's selection. So in other words, he's saying these are artists that should have been in the Biennale in the past but weren't. So there's a different feel about the historical sections, I think. Yes, I mean, he has said that as a statement and he's also said that most of the artists, I think not all of them, but most of the artists were or are well known in their time or in their location. So it is bringing people in who have effectively been ignored from the Biennale all the way through the 20th Hence the century. the line. At the end of every caption, you have, this is this artist's first, first showing at the Venice Biennale. This is, I mean, repeatedly, again and again, you can count practically on the fingers of two hands the artists that have been in a Biennale before by the omission of that statement. So he's really hammering that home, that he is making a parallel Biennale to run parallel to all the past Biennales as well as the contemporary and the, and the future ones. Absolutely. I want to come back to timelines and so on in a minute but before that should we just do the third nucleo storico it's in the arsenale and rather marvelously because i've never been to sao paulo this is the first time i've seen the lina bobardi display system used and I bloody love it. <laughs> it's so beautiful. It's, I, there were actually, were, among other critics, there were some rumblings of discontent about it, but I've never seen it before and I absolutely adore it. Jane, what did you think? Well, perhaps we should describe it. So basically, the works are hung on big sheets of thick plate glass. The bottom of the glass sits in a concrete cube with a sort of groove in it, so it slots into the bottom, and then they they hang from the ceiling. So you've got all these floating pictures and then people walking amongst the floating pictures. And the labels on the back. The labels are on the back. In Brazil, it is in a square 
concrete modernist building but i have to say i thought it looked fantastic it in the arsenal it flies in the arsenal and you walk through this kind of translucent forest of mixed quality again it's italians everywhere mm. the italian diaspora i guess we'd have focused because we're in venice and it's venice biennale but it's it's quite interesting because then that that also implies that every other european country has its own form of diaspora population of mixed quality mixed historical kind of prominence but i mean i love the way you walk through these this forest of images and then look round the back at the label no leaning down squinting and of course the backs of pictures are always fascinating well, that as well. was so interesting to me because one of the things that I think it really reinforces and I think the people who are critical of it would say it's a, such an architect's affectation mm. it doesn't privilege the artist I think the exact opposite it emphasises them as makers they're people that produce physical things that have a, a life and a history and a, and a sort of gorgeous texture that is not just about the image they create so I love that you get up close and very personal to them and also as you say you can get round the back you can see the history and how fascinating it really does give the sense of these pictures moving through time time moving through their own history the labels the strange bits on the back it's it's a really beautiful way of displaying i think every 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 institution should take note absolutely so let's talk about the nucleo contemporaneo now this is the bit which is the lion's share of the biennale it's the contemporary section but jane it's not just a contemporary section is it there is a lot of historical work in that section Yes, again, I feel that Adriano Pedrosa's museum background does really show, again, because it seemed to me, and I don't know what you all think, but it seemed to me that each room is almost like a mini exhibition in itself, in that you quite often have a historic artist put in dialogue with contemporary artists, or what we, we would consider an outsider artist, because I am aware, I think it does say that somewhere on the wall, that this mm. is a, a denigrating Western term. <laughs> but, but he also uses the term outsider. He does, I, say, he does say that word. And, and also, I don't know what else we would right. call them for the purpose of this discussion. So uh, I think Lynn Cook calls them outliers. But anyway, right. it's nice. outsiders, yeah. outliers. So different kinds of artists are placed in dialogue with each other. Well, I love Madge Gill, for example. You know, the English outsider untrue trained artists, all her strange faces and this kind of meticulously wrought. There's a huge processional wall-sized piece of hers paired with an, a contemporary Italian artist who works in an idiom that is quite retro in itself because it's taken from old photographs of women at work. So you've got this kind of forgotten females in the case of the Italian paintings, they're unacknowledged in, in the photographic evidence. Madge Gill, long time forgotten. These kind of wonderful dialogues kick and off. There's a wonderful symmetry, and I wanted to talk about symmetries, actually, because there's lots of really, I think, beautiful bits of hanging in the show. You look at the Madge Gill and you would do a vault fast and turn around and you see an enfilade of galleries and then at the other end is a very long vitrine which contains the work of Aloise, who is a Swiss outsider, outlier artist. That was one of the things I really loved about this show. There is an extraordinary range of imagery in it, but they've thought very, very carefully about how to present a, such a disparate amount of material in a very clear way. I don't know if you agree with that, Jane. Yes, I do. And I think that one of the things I, I was very aware of, Adriano Pedrosa said that he was going to make these nucleo historicos very sort of intense with lots of things in it. And then he hoped that the rest of it would feel less dense. Now, I think it is a lot less dense and you often get four or five works by one artist on one wall or round two walls and then four or five works by another artist, maybe a third in the middle. It's very restrained. It's quite strict, actually, I think, in its sort of formal pacing. I think the people who have found it dense have found it dense because because we don't know most of the artists, you do have to read most of the wall text. And let's also face it, a lot of people find it dense and irritating because they come from the very art worlds and the very art histories that, that Pedro's is trying to disrupt. And also, most of these artists aren't represented. There are no dealers here, hardly, you know, because they haven't got their galleries hovering. Galleries, a lot of these artists are dead, so galleries can't scoop them up, find them. And I think it's very interesting how the whole kind of commercial aspect, not completely, of course, because the Biennale has always got represented artists in, in different places and pavilions. But there is a sense here of a very non-commercial feel, which is very refreshing, I think. I agree. And also there isn't a lot of what I think of as, in quotes, Biennale art, by which I mean big, showy, flashy pieces. There are some large works, and I think he has punctuated, particularly in the Arsenale, as you would expect, he's punctuated thematic galleries, often then with a single work, 
on a related theme in the next gallery, you know, one big work, and then we move back to the next sort of thematic space. But it's not got that big, glitzy, showy, very 2005 art. On that volume of historical work in the contemporary show, are you troubled by that at all? Because one of the things I was thinking was, should the Venice Biennale be a barometer of what's happening right now in contemporary art? Or is it perfectly fine to do a very museum-y Venice Biennale? I know that as few museum directors who I won't name have said, this is a museum show. In fact, several museum shows. The Biennale should be about showcasing living artists, showcasing young artists, giving people a break. And I think to an extent that's true, but there are an awful lot of really interesting you know, I mean, 150 or so young artists who are in this show as well. And also, I think, you know, it's, it's his one chance, Pedrosa, to really change the canon. So I think it is canon changing, but I also do think there is a point that, you know, a lot of dead artists means that a lot of living artists are left out to an extent. I think it is a fair point that we aren't seeing, I don't think, the next kind of big museum and art market star. You know, I think some years we have seen those people. But on the other hand, I mean, going back to the point about these thematic rooms, you know, there's one room that's got, it's all about landscape and it's got Kay Walking Stick, who's a Native American artist. Mm. There's a Lebanese modernist called Arif El Rayas, an outsider artist called Leopold Strobel. And in, I think she was 90. She was actually in the galleries, um, North Korean, but moved to Argentina sculptor called Kim Young Shin. And I think I could actually imagine all those artists having more museum shows and more of a market. Kay Walking Stick's already represented by galleries. But, you know, in general. So, so there are people that will be picked up from this. It's tricky, though, isn't it? Because in 2019, Ralph Rogoff did all contemporary artists. And some people complained about that and felt like he'd pick people who were sort of probably the sort of stars of the time. And some people were a bit like, oh, well, you know, we know all those people. But of course, most of the public who were coming to the show don't know any of those people. Exactly. Yeah, that's a really good point. Now, let's talk about the pacing in the Arsenale, because I think the Arsenale, as we all know, we've been to many Biennales, and we all know that that can be a slog. It's many hundreds of metres long. It can be utterly thankless by the time you get to the end of it but again the hanging has been I think very astute in the sense that you don't feel that I don't think I think it's extraordinary because you walk in and there's this translucent canopy of interwoven Mm. I think it's polyester luggage ties really geometric really constructivist but it's actually by the Mataho collective from New Zealand so it totally dispels any kind of folksy indigenous thought but it's it's light it's airy with the Inca Shonabari's astronaut to the side being a stranger everywhere and then you walk in and then bam you're absolutely absolutely embraced in a riot of colour mm. by this extraordinary Mexican artist, uh, Frida Turano Viega, who I didn't know of at all, a queer female uh, Mexican artist, a vast piece that's all embroidery and canvas and paint of motor forms. She loves cars, apparently. So you've got colour, and then you go back around the other side again, there's ceramics on a lower plane. So you have this lovely pacing, dark into light, vistas, a really, I think, striking aesthetic feel. And you think, this man is a real curator. Yes, he's a museum director, but he also loves the visuals. Going back to that symmetry that I was talking about earlier, there's a lovely symmetry in, in the the Arsenale between that work that you just described and a work by the Aravani Art Project, which is at the end of the... Which end ends of, the whole thing in a riot of colour and figures. Exactly that. And I think, I think you know, it's, it's mural at one end, mural at the other. And that's, just little things like that, I think, show you that the framing has been really, really carefully thought of, Jane. But I would defy anybody on either the Giardini or the Arsenale, just because they are such big spaces, not to feel at some point a bit like, oh, this is such an enormous show. But again, I think for the Met, for the general public, they would be able to stop and have a coffee and have a lunch. You know, I think we're always on deadline pressure. So there is always that feeling of we've got to get through it, we've got to get through it, probably in not quite enough time. I mean, my one kvetch would be the disobedience archive in the centre of the Arsenale, which is, he calls it a zoetrope, but it's a sort of many, many sort of circular walls embedded with multifarious video screens, all recording artists, activists, political activists, including our own British John O'Confra's um, Black Audio Collective. And I mean, no way are you going to sit and look at all no. those, ever, ever, ever. You whiz through and think, I'll come back to this. But I mean, I think, again, this is a curator going, this is my one chance to lay out my stall to the entire art world. But then after that, when you go into 
another stream of light again. So yeah. you do have this, this pacing going on. And I also love the fact that the aesthetics have a real kind of background. There's a, a beautiful series of, of metal curly grills, found fencing and found window grill sculpture freestanding mm. by an artist from Angola, Kiljani Kia Herda. Sorry if I'm mispronouncing. I think we're allowed to mispronounce a bit because yeah, this is new, yeah. new territory. So many new names, so we're bound to get <laughs> some wrong. Angola artists using a grill as an abstract form of both protection and also uh, hostility. Oh, but yeah, those were great. Those yeah. are great. But then through those, there's some beautiful hanging pieces of fabric in various forms of kind of orange and yellow. But this is actually an artist who's, who's a Palestinian Saudi artist. And these drapes, if you look closely, they're torn, they're mended. It's about wrecked historical sites in Gaza. And they're also steeped in dye that's medicinal dye. So even the abstraction, even the visually rich, always have a backstory in this Biennale. That's right. And it's that work grows apparently every time that Dana Awatani makes it so that those rips and then sutures are a record of everything that she turns to in order to record violence of that kind. Another historical site gets totaled and another bit of the bit of the piece gets made. So what looks like a rather beautiful decorative, dare I say, piece hanging behind the metal grills are all imbued with histories and stories and meaning and often really, you know, devastating meaning and stories. Absolutely. Now, one of the light motifs, as Adriano Pedrosa calls them through the show, is about families of artists. Um, I thought this was quite well done, especially when you had two indigenous artists from the same family in the same space. I wanted to particularly mention the Yahuacani father and son, so Santiago Yahuacani and Remba Yahuacani. And they are really interesting because they are both working on a massive scale. The father, Santiago, is working on paper and there's this sort of teeming array, which is very similar to the, to the mural on the outside of the, of the Giardini Biennale as a whole, with animals and humans and hybrid forms. And then, and then his son works on canvas, but works against a kind of darker background with much of the same imagery, lots of text, kind of protest material. And I think where these family relationships show a kind of a, an evolution of the same language, I think they're really powerful, I, actually. I love that. I love the Rodriguez family um, from Bogota. And, and you've got, you know, Abel. He was a plantsman, particular plantsman. He's beautiful, botanical, um, untrained, so very kind of stylistically rendered plants of, of the Colombian jungle, the rainforest, all these amazing plant specimens, very accurate and simply rendered. And then his son, Ayakobo, goes off into a whole other, much more densely naturalistic, but still very much using the, you know, the forms and the natural forms of the plants and the animals that they're surrounded by. So you get father handing that kind of eco-baton and this love of the actual natural world onto his son. The son's work, who calls himself Ayakobo, was actually one of my favourite things in the Biennale. And he had... It's almost like these calendars or yeah. zodiacal calendars. Mm, yeah. <laughs> They're absolutely beautiful. And Rembo Yawakani, I mean, those were s- stunning, I thought. They almost looked like Hieronymus Bosch like mm. animals floating on this very sort of liquid, dark background. I mean, those were beautiful works. Absolutely. The queer aspect of the show, I thought, was really super powerful and very, very dominant, actually. I, and actually, Pedrosa said that, that, that he wanted it to feel very intersectional. And I think actually the inter- section between refugees and migrants and queer people is very strong throughout the show and I just wanted to mention a couple of artists that really hit me Kang Sung Lee from Seoul who works in LA has a whole body of work about artists from the past who died of AIDS and among them is Go Chu San who is a choreographer from Singapore and Jose Leonilson from Brazil a Brazilian conceptual artist and he brings them together in this amazing dance performance it's called Lazarus which was also the name of this shirt made by Leonilson which is two shirts joined together and these two dancers perform this dance with these two shirts and I, I was absolutely kind of solar plexus, almost disabled by watching this. It's so moving and so powerful. So that video is in the rather strange little vaulted spaces at the end of the Arsenale, which you have to make a bit of a walk to. But then in the Giardini, he's showing these incredibly delicate, beautiful, again, 
aid themed constructions which have got pencil drawings and bits of sculpture and everything else but he also uses the language of Martin Wong which is amazing that those sort of strange hand forms which form letters well I suddenly looked at that work and thought that looks like Martin Wong and then of course I realised he was paying tribute to the sign hand letters of Martin Wong and I love this picking up of the baton and taking it in different directions completely and I just want to say right at the very end of the Arsenale in the Giardini della Vergine where there's that beautiful film you talk about also there's the wonderfully named Agnes Question Mark who does an extraordinary cyborg type figure and it's uh, she's a trans woman and it's a pregnant figure lying there but with her eye projected it's all about surveillance in the womb and about fertility and about reproduction and gender fluid reproduction and I mean a very, very young artist, and also next door, very close to the wonderful Anna Maria Molino, who, of course, has won the Golden Lion, who does the most beautiful piece with clay and wonderfully smelling aromatic pine and a recording, and you think, this woman is the mama. She's a great (laughs) artist. But with these young, you know, maverick souls all around her. That's wonderful. And, And, Jane, anything that really stood out for you? There was a painter near the end of the Giardini uh, called Louis Frattino, Louis yeah. Frattino, who might be very well known in the States. I didn't really know his work. Paints these kind of um, queer genre scenes. I think, I think they're a bit about the tension about being gay, the tension between that and your family. Because I think this idea of being a foreigner, it isn't always, you know, a, a foreigner in a foreign land or being indigenous, a foreigner in your own land. It's sometimes at the very personal level of your lifestyle not being accepted by your society or your family. I thought his paintings were very striking. And I also liked this uh, young Lebanese artist called Omar Misma, who makes, um, they're like little mosaics. Oh, the mosaics. I love those. He was on my hit list as well. Yes. Yeah. yeah. And they reference ancient cultures, but they also have quite a few homoerotic ones. I thought they were striking. Just to make a quick point about Louis Fratino, he does these gay, as you say, intimate scenes of domesticity, slightly uneasy domesticity, but one of them is actually a homage to Christopher Woods. So yes. you have the British gay artist, again, batons being picked up and handed round. And I love the feeling of this global art historical you know fraternity sorority fluidity between all these different artists within their activism absolutely and just very briefly i thought that there was a lovely correspondence in different parts so fratino is in the giardini but with salman tour in the arsenale he's painting i love his paintings i think his language is evolving so beautifully he's such a great painter so yeah wonderful correspondences even between the different parts of the biennale my final thought was that one of the things that i felt really strongly about that main show is about intimacy on the one hand and violence on the other and the ways that these are played out. That was my abiding feeling from the show. There was lots of tenderness, but extraordinary amounts of of really kind of hard-hitting stuff as well. So it's an extraordinary show. We could never summarise it, even in the long time that we've had to talk about it, but thank you. Let's move on to talking about the pavilions now. We've got an interview with John O'Confra coming up in a minute, but John O'Confra was one of your picks, wasn't it, Louisa? Well, Listening All Night to the Rain, I think, is the most extraordinary pavilion. Never since Mike Nelson have I seen the British Pavilion so transparent transformed, so changed, but of course in a completely different way to Mike Nelson because this is a rigorous, beautiful installation of multifarious screens and you enter now via the basement not in the grand entrance, there are screens on the entrance of the Biennale, so already you're seeing electronic fragments of, of a conference thoughts, so you go down into the basement where it's all covered in purple, rich colours throughout the pavilion, based on Rothko's palette in fact, but this purple undercarriage where you get multiple screens ranging from, you know, hands with songs, riots, Holbein pictures, produce from across the globe, but all covered by rippling water, eddies and rills of water. So you get the sense of a comfort. Of course, water is his overriding theme, but you get the sense of this whole pavilion is linked by the watercourse. But going in the basement like that, that gives the kind of the undertow, as it were. Then upstairs you go to these several forms laid out like cantos, he calls them, Mm. across history, across biology, across eco, across everything with a rich soundscape, a comfort and and his former Black Audio Collective, now Smoking Dogs Compadres, his colleagues are actually in the films as well. So it's a wonderfully enveloping, really extraordinary, ambitious work. Jane, anything stood out for you? I thought the Archie Moore Pavilion, that's the Australian pavilion, was an incredibly successful one. I thought it was a really interesting idea, really well executed. Basically, he's covered the pavilion with blackboard paint and with chalk. He has drawn out 
a history of his ancestry, name after name after name, linking up all across the ceiling. And it's supposed to be going back 60,000 years. Now, I imagine that's quite difficult to do. And I imagine a lot of it is oral and uh, yeah, stories and memories. But, but basically, it's this incredible sort of network uh, where you see names change from one language to another because of the colonialization. So some names are English, some are German, some are Dutch, then they go into Aboriginal Some are very names. racist. Yeah, that's true. And there are erasures, I think they call it. There are patches where things are rubbed out mm. because... Um, you know, there's been a massacre or there's been a disease, violence. I mean, it, it, it's a sort of incredible memorial, isn't it, Louisa? It absolutely is. And I think it's it's so interesting because on one side, his, his family, uh, Indigenous Australian, on the other side, Scottish. And these bubbles of names interconnect and change and flow across the ceiling. And then, of course, in the middle of this pavilion, there's this island with water around, these white blocks. It looks like very rigorously abstract. And you look closer, and actually it's piles of documents. And it's piles of documents investigating Indigenous Australian deaths in custody, some redacted to preserve the names, some with gaps because the inquiries are ongoing. Some of them are Moore's own family. So what looks very abstract and blocky and white is actually a, a landscape of loss with this extraordinary flowing of names changing its language from indigenous to colonial and back again up over the ceiling so you've got this feeling of lineage and not in any remotely aboriginal style of execution it looks rigorous it looks using the very formal language of all the art histories that pedrosa of course is trying to mess with it's really interesting. Do you want to talk about Jeffrey Gibson? Again, we've got an interview with him coming up, but I, I loved it. I came out with a smile on my face, but also having learned a lot and also had a strong conviction of how beautifully he's able to weave together joy and critique. It's, an, it's, a, it's a difficult art to pull out, as, as we'll hear, but, but I thought that was great. Well, because he's part Choctaw, he's part Cherokee, he's queer, he's also lived in Korea, he's also lived in an American met metropolitan cities, and you've got all that feeding through. But the, what struck me about that pavilion was just zinging colour. Yeah. I mean, amazing blastings of colour and the beadwork and the heads. And at the end, that marvellous, exhilarating video of women dancing to fantastic music, rhythmic music that's kind of electro, kind of indigenous music. You know, it's absolutely stunning. But very very celebratory, but also hardcore. You know, you look closer at some of the labels in the beading and it's making remarks about being excluded, being exiled, being a foreigner, as it were. Yeah, I mean, it's a sort of incredible mashup, isn't it, of Native American imagery and arts and crafts like beading, Western sort of geometric sort of abstraction, queer identities, high culture, pop culture, all Kitch mashed again, up. playing with taste again, I think, very interestingly. Yeah, but I, I think it's a very, it's unusually optimistic, isn't it? Because at the end of the day, he his message seems to be that we are much better when we kind of mash up together than, yeah. It was nice to come out of something thinking that was hard hitting, but, but uplifting. Celebratory. I think there's a lot of celebration in this Biennale, actually. There's a lot of grim part. There's a lot of undertow stories we've talked about. But there is a feeling of let's mash up, let's be optimistic, let's be celebratory as well. And I think that's quite relieving because sometimes one can get very ground down just by the sheer horror of everything. One of my absolute pavilion high points was Wild Sharky in the Egyptian pavilion, an Alexandrian artist who normally works with marionettes and puppets and, and, and fantasy, sort of folkloric, but he's made this extraordinary drama using real actors but working in quite a puppet-like way in very stylized backdrops. It's called Drama, 1882, and it actually spells out the events and also the consequences of the Arabi uprising in Egypt in 1882, and it's really an extraordinary, I sat through all 45 minutes of it, absolutely gripped, and I think it's a real contender. Yeah, the musical score is amazing, mm. isn't it? It's like a contemporary opera. It's sung in Arabic. And beautifully sung in Arabic. I mean, it's so resonant. The use of the language. I don't understand Arabic, but I was gripped and you felt the passion and the narrative unfolding. Absolutely. And the staging is incredible, isn't it? Because it does look like, almost like puppet theatre because of these hand-painted, handmade sets. And as you say, the way the people move, it's almost like they've got strings. There's a bit where everyone is supposed to be shot or blown up and they all just collapse forward like their puppets but it is sort of a farce it has a lot of humor in it 
And yet it's a bit like it's staged by Robert Wilson, like an opera by Robert Wilson. So it's really, really special. I mean, what a talented artist. Fantastic. We're just very briefly going to touch on a couple of the collateral shows because there were two really exceptional shows that both Louisa and I really loved. So uh, we're going to talk about de Kooning first. That's at the Academia, the great historic Venetian space. And it is a knockout show. It is a knockout show and it focuses on de Kooning's two seismic trips to Italy, once in 1959 and once in 1969. They weren't seen as seismic until now really but they clearly were from when you look at the stuff well I love the fact that one of the labels it said you know he bored his friends constantly about Venetian brushstrokes again and again and again and actually these Venetian brushstrokes come through there's a capsule of the late works which show the brushstrokes unleashed but what you really see here are the works astonishing the works he made in Rome in 1959 he had very few materials Mm. these black and white works ink inscribed to his friends and then he made his first sculptures in 1969 Small pieces made in his hand, so cast in bronze by a friend. Beautiful the, things. Beautiful things that you then see exploding into the larger bronzes. You then see these lush brush strokes coming through with, of course, the great women paintings, the great abstracts. A fantastic abstract painting he made, a, a homage to the Villa Borghese in yeah. Rome. I mean, united with two other works that he made in Italy that you'll never see together again. Absolutely. Jane. What's very interesting as well is that I think for Italians, they will also see the connection to Italian artists of that period. And I actually think one of them, Afro Basaldella, who also worked in this very strong black and white sort of form and lent to Kooning a studio. So I think... Gary Garrels, the curator, said he was very interested to show there was this connection between de Kooning and what was happening in what was a very exciting time in Italian art with similar rows going on between figuration and abstraction. How interesting. And lastly, uh, Louise, we're going to talk about Jean Cocteau. At the Guggenheim, Peggy Guggenheim collection, there is a, a wonderful show of Cocteau's work. Cocteau is a terrible painter wonderfully. <laughs> Ken Silver, the curator, has avoided the paintings largely. He put one in. I think it's good he put one in because, again, it can skew art histories. It can get quite hagiographic. If you don't show, they can do some bum notes and his painting was, but it focuses on the drawings and indeed on the films as well. It made me want to go off and see all his oh, films. Yeah, yeah. But what exquisite drawings. Beautiful, small scale. They do these very small capsule shows in, in the Guggenheim, which actually works very well in the spaces. So you can get very intimately involved with the extraordinary polymath that was Jean Cocteau. And he always said that, that his drawing was an extension of his handwriting and you really feel that. There's, there's lots of drawings as dedications in books and things like that. It's all very intimate and really beautifully done. They do these beautiful archival shows. You get the sense of this extraordinary mercurial Curial man with this glorious line, this glorious handwriting, the stars that was his trademark. It's called the juggler, and he juggled so many skills. Well, Louisa and Jane, thank you as ever. Thank you. Thank you. It's been great being here. The Venice Biennale opens tomorrow, 20th of April, and continues until the 24th of November. You can hear my interview with Adriano Pedrosa in the episode of this podcast from the 2nd of February. On our sister podcast, A Brush With, meanwhile, you can hear interviews with some of the artists who feature in shows around Venice this year, including the latest episode with Capuani Kawanga, recent episodes with Alex Katz and Shazia Sikander, who both have solo shows around town, and in our back catalogue, interviews with Yinka Shonabari, Pierre Huig, Julie Meritu and John O'Confra. Now, although the National Pavilions are curated and organised independently of Adriano Pedrosa's international exhibition, many share its themes and concerns. None more so, as you've heard, than the US Pavilion, where Jeffrey Gibson, a member of the Mississippi Band of Choctaw Indians, who's of Cherokee descent, addresses queerness as well as indigenous aesthetics, histories and resistance in his work. I went to the pavilion, one of the biggest of the pavilions in the Giardini, or gardens, where the Biennale began in 1895, to meet him. Jeffrey, the title of your pavilion is The Space in Which to Place Me. It seems to be multiply relevant, if you know what I mean. There's lots of meanings one can extrapolate from it. Mm -hmm. Is that a very deliberate strategy? It can mean a lot of things to different people whilst also being very specific in terms of what it refers to in relation to yourself. Absolutely. I think The Space in Which to Place Me, it's an excerpt from a poem titled Hesepa from Lakota poet Lady Long Soldier. And Lely is somebody whose work I followed for a number of years. And I think when I read this poem, it's about how our identities are really formed between us rather than simply by us or by the other. Um, It's really a meeting point at how we see each other and how we engage with each other that ultimately determines the perceptions that we have. And so 
from the very beginning, as much as my background is focused in Native American histories, I really want this to be an inclusive space that mine might be the narrative that we're looking at here, but also understanding that what other people, what viewers and audience members bring to this international space is really important in determining what that ultimately means. I like that riffing on the notion of space in relation to the pavilion because it is a space and it is a loaded space. Do you feel that there are ghosts in this space that you need to address? You know, the first time I came to the Biennale, I think it was 2005, and Felix Gonzalez Torres was the artist who Mm. was representing And I remember already being a huge fan. He had already been influential on my thinking as an artist. But also the fact that that proposal was initially proposed in the 90s. And then it was shown here after he had passed. And so then I started paying attention, you know. And then I think Mark Bradford, Simone Lee, like these other artists. So I would say more spirit. Nice. Spirit than ghosts. Because I think ghosts somehow connote that they're like trapped here and need some sort of releasing. <laughs> I think what some of the artists who I've paid attention to here released a lot of that right. and, and, and made space for me. Yeah, and it's a very particular space, isn't it? I mean, of course, it it's, it's that got it that sort of colonial, historical kind of feel, but you, like Simone before you, yeah. have really played with the external, internal dialogue and so yeah. on. You've really wanted to amp up. Yeah the properties of the building, if you like. Which might actually say something about the generations that we were born onto, mm-hmm. you know, where it's sort of like creative thinkers of color. We want to make, we want to be the audience, we want to be the content makers of things. And, you know, when we came here and looked at the building, seeing what people had already done, I just felt like you can't not do it. Right. That kind of format had already been established as such an opportunity, why would you not take it? Right, absolutely. Yeah. And of course, one of the ways that you're doing that is with this extraordinary colour. Yes. And noticed in the, in the sort of text around the show, there's, yeah. a, there's mention of chromophobia. Yeah. Can you explain a little more about that? What, what do you mean well, What do you mean by chromophobia? I mean, one of the interesting things about working with the two curators we worked with, Abigail Winograd and Kathleen Ash Milby, in addition to, you know, lots of other people, mm. historically, we've learned a sort of like tones of grey and white and black and monochromes kind of indicate like intellect and they indicate some sense of like austerity when in fact historically cultures have used so much color and unfortunately over time an expansive use of color has come to allow people to think that it somehow like cheapens things or somehow it makes them less serious or it makes them less potent or eclectic which I hate the word eclectic (laughs) and um, and so you know first of all I know where my use of color comes from I absolutely know where it comes from and if anything as an artist I'm trying to currently push my use of color and what does that mean because you know I'm 52 I've worked with color for a very long time this has really pushed me to think about like how do I use color how do I use pattern How am I trying to tell a story? How do I use it to activate and also to emotionally tap into people with color? It seems to me that also what you do by this incredible engagement with colour is create a really interesting space between joy and critique. Yes. And it seems to me that's enormously difficult to achieve that. I've worked at it for a very long time. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah. But tell us about that because I've been sitting here for quite a while and people leaving this pavilion yeah. with smiles on their faces. People yeah. are experiencing great joy here. Yeah. But they are also going to come away with very serious ideas about the connotations of the texts that they've been reading in relation to indigenous right. histories and the history right. of the US and so on. You know, it's interesting. There was another really important thing came up during this past year for me. And I always talk about it. Many of the texts that I use have articulated things that although I felt, I may not have had the words to express them. So then I, I use the words. Here, my history of looking at historic objects made by Native people and finding them beautiful and also being very aware of the traumatic histories of Native people. Mm. And I was like, they're sort of counter to each other, right? They're sort of like, why, if you were being forcibly relocated, if there was such abuse on your communities, why would you take the time to make beautiful things? And I realize now what I've started looking at those historic objects as, a creation of an encapsulation of beauty. It's an encapsulation of hope. It's an encapsulation of choice and autonomy to make something. Yeah. And when you make something that's for a specific use, for a specific person, from a specific material, with a specific intention, you are extracting yourself from this mass-produced culture that we live in, which right. is killing us. 
Right. And it's so interesting that you've incorporated found objects yeah. by ancestral creators yeah. Yeah. And, and given the halos yeah. in, in the pieces so that you're, yeah. you're honouring that tradition. Absolutely. Tell us about how you did that. Is, is that just a, a sort of a natural process of something you're already doing or did you collect them just for the work? For this, I did collect them specifically for the pavilion. I was looking for very specific imagery, very specific kinds of beadwork, certain time periods. But also, it's something that I've wanted to do for a very long time because they have such aura, they have such presence, and they command a kind of, I don't know, historical integrity that I think sometimes in the contemporary we can't see, Yeah, you know? But also, the reason I, I hadn't done it so much before was because it's not my work, and I need to figure out, like, how do I actually frame this so I'm acknowledging the person who made it, even right. if we don't know their name, you know? Yeah. And so a lot of the pieces in here we know could have potentially been made for sale, And there was an economy of labor during the 20th century, during the late 19th century. There was a market for some of these things. There were preferences. But there's also, even within there, there's moments where people are choosing to use flowers instead of geometry as a way of identifying themselves. When religion, for instance, was viewing the geometry as a coded language. Right. Who knew what people were saying to each other? Right. So we're hoping that if people see these objects and recognize who made it or know something more about the object than we we know that they will share it with us and we will do our due diligence and if there is reason to return the objects we have traced everything and we will remake or commission a new piece to, ah, re- to replace it that's so nice yeah. about that whole joy and critique thing yeah it seems to me that there's also something going on in, in the, your use of text in relation to that yeah because there's yeah. Nina Simone lyrics yeah birds flying high you know how I feel which mm-hmm. it, which right. made my spirit sore right. And then there are federal records. Yeah. So you've got that interplay between certain types of text. And again, Mm. that's a very interesting space to occupy between languages. Even though it's the same words, there's different languages, if you like. I mean, language only gets more tricky, I feel like, as I get older. Um, And especially now, I don't speak my native language, Mm -hmm. which would be Choctaw or Cherokee. Mm -hmm. And, you know, I've never lived in an area where that would have been in use on a daily basis. Also, both of my parents grew up in times when they were told not to speak their languages. They went to Indian boarding schools. So language for me, especially in English, I've looked for things that hopefully can mean different things to what the viewer brings to it in the moment. You know, so like even like the word truths, we hold these truths to be self-evident. Your truths are going to be different from my truths. They're going to be different from someone else's truths. It's based on what your priorities are. You know, we live in a world of pronoun self-identification. How much that has thrown people. But on the other hand, it's just sort of like, it's actually not that complicated, you know. It's (laughs) just sort of like... So anyhow, so I think with language, it started off with me actually, I think, having come of age just as the AIDS crisis in the 80s was really happening. And I was not losing all of my communities, but I was sharing spaces with people who were, older generations of primarily gay men who were. Mm. And in my 30s, I was looking back at that music that I was dancing to so joyously. I was listening to the lyrics, and I'm like, oh, they're asking for help. They're actually talking about bringing things home and people dying. They're talking about losing people and their cries put to a dance beat, Mm -hmm. you know? So there was something about this that made me kind of understand how we understand language based on where we are in our minds and in our lives at the time that we hear them and also who said them you know so that lyric sung by Nina Simone is going to be very different than being sung by somebody else lastly there's a really nice interplay with the main show here yeah and your pavilion there's even a term that's used by Adriano Pedrosa and in the text around your work, which is anthropophagia yeah which is this idea of a kind of cultural cannibalism did you feel any kind of responsibility to know what Adriano was doing in the main show or is it just a lateral thinking a kind of connection because this is 2024 and this is yeah. what's urgent now you know? I think it was lateral thinking but I also think you know generationally these are the ideas that have been coming up for us you know kind of mm. collectively creative thinkers, writers, artists and I think this idea of like how do we strengthen ourselves to move forward intentionally and I think empowering ourselves I think the Anthropophagic Manifesto that was introduced to me probably 12, 15 years ago, it made perfect sense to me. And what I thought was so amazing about it is, well, one, it has to do with time. 
so the jingles that you see on the garments in here mm. would have historically been the throwaway lids of tobacco and snuff containers. And it comes through an origin story of a man having a dream about women dancing, making the sound of these jingles on the dress. Since that time, the jingle dress dance went into the powwow circuit, became an intertribal dance, predominantly danced by women. And those jingles are now commercially produced for a market that doesn't serve anything else other than jingle dress dancers. Right. And now people consider this to be a ceremonial dance. So to me, that is the most successful form of cultural cannibalism. It was like before it became garbage, it was picked up and turned into something else that supports somebody. That's a wonderful way to end. Jeffrey, thank you yeah. so much. Thank you. Next, I spoke to John Acomfra, who, as you heard earlier in our review, is showing a hugely ambitious presentation called Listening All Night to the Rain in the UK Pavilion, exploring intersecting themes which have dominated his practice over many years, including post-colonialism and the climate catastrophe. It features dozens of screens arranged across a number of movements or cantos. Acomfra draws on sources including the 11th century Chinese writer and artist Su Dong Po's poetry, which provides the pavilion's title, the work of another poet, Ezra Pound, and art as diverse as Mark Rothko and John Everett Millet. Together, the eight cantos tell lyrical stories of migrant diasporas in Britain. I spoke to John to find out more. John, I was struck looking at the installation here in the British Pavilion that it seemed to me that there were lots of your past works echoing through this new work too. Plus there's the presence of David Warner and Lena Gopal actually in the film. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And I wonder to what extent is this partly, even if subtly, a retrospective project as well as a really significant body of new work? That's a very astute observation. (laughs) Um, Yes and no. I mean, yes, in the sense that having been at this for a while, there's a way in which you too become part of the strangeness, as George Lamming once famously said. Mm -hmm. So um, the, the work and the people I've worked with and I have gone on for so long now, at least 30 years, that it feels legitimate to turn to each other and, and some of the past work as archival traces, if you will, as reference, as indications of the way to go. But I think, yeah, I think you're also right. It wouldn't be entirely honest to say that I'm doing something about listening and that the facility of listening offers us a kind of avenue into memory. Yeah. It wouldn't be right to then say that and then not refer to your own memories in some ways. You're right in that sense, yes. I am almost certainly doing something much more autobiographical in this than I have done right. with some of the others. Yes. That's really interesting. The thing that it seems to me makes it all hang together is that you've got these beautiful through lines. There are the metronomes, there are the clock faces, mm-hmm. there's water mm-hmm. Rush, mm-hmm. Uh, you know, running over surfaces and... And it seems to me that if you're going to present this many screens and this many different rooms and so on, you've got to have these sort of anchors. You know, did you have to decide, OK, what are our anchors, if you like, before? Uh, absolutely. I mean, I've done quite a lot of talking today about <laughs> what the ambitions were behind the project. And, and of course, one of them is almost certainly about finding one of the four elements that could cohere everything. And water was that for this project. But you're right to also point out that water is joined by a kind of orchestra of objects and artefacts. And clearly, yes, the recurring ones of clock faces and metronomes were a way of trying to introducing patterns. I mean, I think when you've got this many screens, one needs to find a way of calming fewer down to say, okay, look, I know it looks like a lot of screens, but actually it's the same thing. Yeah. Because if, if you can then allay those fears that they're going to be bombarded with an array of imagery, that in a way what they were going to be watching are six screens packed with MTV-like shot cuts and so on. If they could relax with that, then you can get away with some of the more elliptical, more deeper, if you will, questions that you're trying to raise to do with time and becoming and being and you know mortality all of those have an easier passage if people somehow believe that they are watching something slower and measured right and less frenetic right but actually the thought patterns are equally frenetic yeah. as as any mtv project it's just that it feels slower um thank god <laughs> but that, that's important because we yeah. we tried several times to 
speed things up and it just got crazy. So one of the things I do a lot is to repeat. Mm. I mean, quite literally shots. Yeah. We've doubled up shots. Or you get a close up of somebody that lasts three seconds. Or three seconds in a six screen piece is useless. Right. <laughs> you might as well throw it away. But if you can double it, but then there's also lovely moments which feel very much like memory to me in the sense mm. that you might have two repeating moments and then a very similar but not quite the same image on the screen at the same time. So it has that sort of texture of memory. In yes, a way. yes. I mean, there, there was the French writer Gaston Bachelard, who's really important for almost all my projects, actually. But this one, his work on, on, on water and dreams in particular. Mm. And he alerted me a couple of years back to the different ways in which the memorial can be accessed using questions of liquidity, using water. And that seemed important because, I, I mean, I, I didn't want anyone to think, oh, well, you know, we're, they're talking about half a millennium of, you know, British history, but it's the same memory. Well, it's not. <laughs> they're different kinds. It was important to try and find ways of suggesting the variety of memory, the randomness of memory, uh, the abbreviative ways in which it, it erupts and then disappears. All of those seemed important to suggest so that you ended up with something that approached a kind of encyclopedia of gestures, all of which were pointing to the presence of the memorial. You mentioned dreams there. Yes. There's a lot of other art in these works. Yes. One of the things that I think is there, where I don't know if it's, a, it's quoted so much as referred to in your, your own language, yes. is, the, is the kind of dreamscape of surrealism. And that there's a lot of figures standing in landscapes littered with objects which seem anti-rational or, yes. or yes. you know, so tell yes. us about that. Yeah, you're right to alert um, <laughs> the viewers to the presence of of surrealism because in a way it's it's there isn't a direct reference i mean the direct references are to figures like kurt schwitters and rothko because of the color but yes the informing spirit is the spirit of surrealism where the the collapse of the sacred and the secular the rational and the dreamlike or sitting somehow in that liminal space between the two felt like the way to go because i think in the way if you decide to do a project on listening. It seems to me that listening is always a way of accessing the elsewhere. When people listen, they somehow go off, quite mm -hmm. literally, yeah. into, into another space. And to try and find a way of making visible that elsewhere seem to require at least some input from surrealism, if nothing else, you know. I mean, surrealism was a political movement. In a way, it's become a caricature in a lot of people's minds as, you know, Salvador Dali's floppy clocks, yes. you know. Yes. And one of the things about this film is it contains lots of protest mm. and lots of activism. Mm. And it seems to me is surrealism also a means of accessing a kind of activism that isn't actively protest. So in a way you've got literal protest and a kind of protest by poetry in the same... No, absolutely. And protest by poetry is a completely apposite and on the ball way of naming this because the other thing which is now being forgotten about surrealism is it, its international dimension. Right. The fact is that the length and breadth of the planet in the 1930s and 40s were touched by the spirit of surrealism to the point where some of the great figures in poetry, Amy Césaire, for instance, mm. the French poet, wrote his most famous and literally genre-redefining poem, Return to My Native Land, under the sway and the heady influence of surrealism. Mm. You know, he loved that jagged rhythms mm. that, that, you know, surrealist poetry that he knew or the ideas about dreams and dream works suggested in surrealism. So, yeah, it's, you know, it's been shown of all of that and it's been made into a kind of poodle of the European bourgeoisie to the point where the only figure anyone remembers from surrealism is Salvador Dali, <laughs> the least interesting of the surrealists. <laughs> but hey, <laughs> right, yeah. what, what can you say? I mean, it's not, I'm not mocking Dali, but he was the least influential of the figures involved in that movement. And yeah. It seems kind of weirdly ironic that he would come to stand... <laughs> That's true. Yeah. I wanted to ask about the sound element that you've referred to. Mm. It, it's called, mm. you know, you literally refer to listening in, in the title of the work. Mm. The sound, as you've mentioned, has this sort of very direct connection to memory. Mm. But it's wonderful to 
have the echoes from space to space mm. and you have this kind of dreamscape but you mm. also have a soundscape yes. it seems to me and that and, and that absolutely relies on a kind of slippage from space to space to a certain degree but also a kind of dialogue between the sounds yes really. yes let's just say that from the very beginning one of the demands made by all the other iterations of the pavilion that i've been to in the past suggested that we should keep it porous and not try and close off as a way of controlling the sound but i immediately meant that you were into the realm of sound bleed because things can't be porous unless <laughs> they were also borderless you know, right. in yeah. some way. So stuff was going to seep in. There's a metaphorical aspect to that too. Indeed, indeed, which we were very keen on. But I mean, like with all of the works, a certain amount of it is given over to the chaos and then another element is held in check. So I did work with Tony Meyer, who's an ambisonic expert, a 3D expert, to devise a way in which most of the properties of each room would be kept in that room by directing the signals mm. in some way. So, and generally that works pretty well. But there's always this patina or sheen of the other yeah. <laughs> which stays with you. So you're aware as you sit in any of the smaller rooms adjoining the very large one that there is something behind you yeah. <laughs> which is larger than the thing you're you're sitting in front of so everything has an autonomy but they also have a certain kind of relational affinity with the adjoining pieces and in a way i think that's probably the right way to go you know, for this piece anyway since it was about listening it was important to spatialize and render metonymic <laughs> acts of listening in the piece itself, in the space itself. John, thank you so much. No, my pleasure. Thank you. Now, the UK is one of the longest-running pavilions in the Biennale, having been opened in 1909. But 115 years later, several nations are making their debut at the event. Among them is the Republic of Benin, which has gathered four artists in a pavilion in the Arsenale section, the vast campus of industrial buildings in which, at its height, Venice could produce a ship in a single day. Among the contributors to the Benin Pavilion is the Republic's most famous artist, Romuald Azoumé. I joined him in the pavilion to discuss his work and Benin's debut at the event. Romuald, I wanted to ask you first about the Vodou religion and this historic religion in, in Benin and, and it's at the core of so much that we're seeing in the pavilion as a whole but also in your work. Tell us more. If you want to know what it means Vodou, we need more than four years to explain <laughs> Right, of course we do. Explain that and after four years you will ask me what does that mean again because you, you could not understand really. Right, But I have an, a way to explain what is Vodun really. Vodun is nature. Right. It's how we find something to protect our nature, you know. Mm -hmm. And many people didn't know really what that means. They just say that's something very dangerous. They, they say that it's uh, witchcraft and so, and so on. But it's so stupid to say something like that, you know, because Vodun is nature. It's how we put God inside everything, inside tree, inside earth, inside water, inside sky, inside everything, and how we respect our nature, you know. Right. And of course, there's a really interesting dialogue between the man-made and the natural in your work. These oil cans, which have been at the core of your work for a very long time, reflect a very particular practice of moving fuel across borders and so on and collecting it in these cans and it's a very dangerous operation right so yes that's a curious relationship with the natural in itself yes you know what is the petrol the petrol is is natural you know when everything disappears the the, the tree disappears the water stone everything they become petrol you know right and that's natural too you know and the relationship between this nature and my work is just to say to people, we all are natural. We all will disappear. But what are we doing to make this life better? Right. What are we doing to make this this world better? You right. know, because that's the point of question. Shall we put AA to change everybody to make more money? Shall we destroy our nature to make more money to say? That's what uh, we want to do because we think we must be very rich. You know, that's a lot of stupid things. Right. And through my pieces there, I just put 
the human being in the center of the people. You know, when you just enter, you greet everybody, the dead people first. You greet your ancestor, you say, I'm coming to see you. And when you are in the middle, you have 520 masks who represented people who just fix you, right. who just look at you, who just say to you, you are the most important human being we have today. You exist. You are very strong. You need to take your destiny in your life. You need to take the power. And that power is called Ashe, Ashe. And this Ashe is the name for my pieces. Right. And the human being becomes very important in that way. Right. So you mentioned masks there. And, and of course, your oil can portraits or masks have been a long presence in your work. They've been portraits of politicians. They've been portraits of ordinary people and so on. The mask has been a, a consistent element of your practice. And here it's a kind of gathering. Yes. Yes. You know, Nigeria produces petrol. And all the neighbors from Nigeria, they just bought the petrol from Nigeria and sell it in Benin, Togo, and sometimes in Niger, you know. And after they use the petrol, you have a lot of jury counts. You find that everywhere in my city, every road, in every small road, you will find this jury count. Yeah. What shall we do with the jury count? Maybe sh shall we make a piece of art? That's what I'm doing, you know. And I make mask weave. And for me, it's part of of our life, you know, uh, where we can make some kind of uh, metaphor. And that metaphor become a mask, the mask represented people from right. Benin. And also the, the title of the Benin Pavilion is Everything Precious is Fragile. Yes. It seems to me that that relates to your work in two ways. One is that it's the fragility of the human and particularly the fragility of a human who is taking these jerry cans full of oil if, you know, uh, on these journeys, but also the wider context of yes of the environment. Right? I think that question is not for me. The question will be for the curator who right. find the title. You know, but through the title, I just make my best to how to make the relationship with the title and my work. And just say, just say, ladies who are the best for our culture, mm -hmm. because we from Africa. We just say the men are strong, uh, but it's not true. That's the ladies who control everything, right. you know. Because we say we have a culture which is patriarchal, but it's not patriarchal. That is matriarchal, really. Right. Because the ladies save the spirituality. The ladies save Vodou. The ladies save the Amazon. The ladies save the slavery. Because without the lady, who will talk about Candomblé? in uh, Brazil, who we talk about Candomblé in uh, Santeria, in Havana, you know, everywhere in Santiago de Cuba, in, uh, in uh, Aruba, um, everywhere, you know. And the lady become the point, the middle of our life, you know. Absolutely. And we need to take care of that because the lady become very fragile, you know. Yeah. And I'm very happy since a few years, they, they become somebody who is talking, really, right now right again so their, their voice is amplified their voice yeah. become very important with me too with every every movement we have right now who engage the voice of women because we make a lot of mistake with women we didn't hear them which is very bad because we all you me everybody is come from women we right. need to trust them we need to to hear them and in your this cathedral that you've created of jerry cans, there's this marvellous moment where you stand beneath this canopy and you look up and there's a constellation of yes. stars. Yes. That was obviously very deliberate. <laughs> yes, it was the surprise I get on, on, on when I start to make this piece because that's the small hole we make to attach the metals with the plastic together. Yeah. And after we make that, we, I just say, oh... We will not touch again because that is the sky yeah. with stars, you know. And these stars represent our ancestors. These stars represent our protective people, you know, which is very important. Absolutely. Yes, and beautiful so. And one of the things I'm really interested in in relation to Benin culture is that it's a, a culture of many languages, right? Is yes. it right that you speak yes. six? We have 
No, I speak 11. 11, there you go. Yes. So I tell me about speak, that because it... No, because I speak 11 languages together, but I speak about six or seven languages from Benin, you know? Right. Because we are just talking about language, not dialect. You know, right. dialect is another thing because we have several dialects in South of Benin and you need to be very, very, very strong to speak all the dialects because it's heavy sometimes. But we have... 55 language in Benin. Our neighbor Nigeria have 345, you know, which yes. is a lot, you know. And if you cannot speak the language for your neighbor, you need to speak French. Right. But we together, we find three or six languages to speak together because it's easy. And of course, connected to language is representation. And you're sitting in a pavilion that is representing Benin. Is that something you are proud of? Is it something you want to question with the work? How do you feel about, no, about I'm representation? Very, no, I'm very proud of that because the, the young artists we have here, all the artists, they, they are not so bad, you know, and, and it's necessary, you know, it's necessary to be together with them. I'm very proud for that. I'm very proud for that. But for me, we are talking about Benin. We are not talking about Romuald Hazoumé. Right. Uh, yes, we are talking about Benin. And, and we need to be proud for where we are from. Because the day you forget where you are from, you lost your way. You know? And we didn't want to lose our way. Because, because our country is doing very well right now. It's only the robbers, the corrupt people who think it's not doing well. But it's doing very well, you know. And we hope, we hope it will be better. Romuald, thank you so much for joining thank us. Thank you very much. Back in the Giardini is the pavilion that correlates most strongly with Adriano Pedrosa's Biennale exhibition, the Hujupua Pavilion, which is how the team behind the project has renamed the Brazil Pavilion. The exhibition, Capoeira, We Are Walking Birds, features three artists from the Tupinamba community and the coastal peoples of Brazil, Glisseria Tupinamba, Olinda Tupinamba and Zil Carapoto. Among much else, it tells the story of indigenous resistance in Brazil and the adaptation of communities to the climate emergency. One of its three curators is is Gustavo Caboco Wepichana, and I met him in the pavilion. Gustavo, I imagine that one of the difficult things about doing a pavilion in which you are foregrounding indigenous voices from Brazil is that there are very many different voices from Brazil. Can you tell me something about the decision and how you've gone about it? Because you could have chosen any number of languages and peoples and communities and so on, but this one... It seems extremely effective in terms of the kind of messages that are at the heart of the pavilion. Yes, we are three curators. So me, Gustavo, Denilson Baniwa and Arisana Patasho. And one of our first proposals for the pavilion was to change the name. So instead of assuming Brazilian pavilion, we proposed Rampoa Pavilion. The meaning of Rampoa is a big territory on Pachohan, the language from the Patasho people. Mm-hmm. Arisana is from the Patasho people, so in her language, big territory or big land uh, is Hanhampua. So the pavilion is quite small, so we didn't have the chance to invite a lot of artists. One of the first artists we thought about was Gliceria Tupinamba, from the Tupinamba people, and she has a research on the mantos Tupinamba, cloaks, right? That's the word in English, but we've been calling mantos. Yeah. She's been doing this research since 2006, I guess, and she's trying to connect like the discussions in mu- museums and looking into all those archives and stories and connecting with her community. So the Tupinamba people, when we think about them, we had uh, many stories about those people, but always from the colonization point of view, right. like Hans Stadin or Debris right. or in other thinkers. Even when we think about the art history in Brazil, modernism in Brazil, they start uh, Oswald de Andrade, he's proposing the anthropophagia, yes. which is, it comes from this idea from the Tupinamba people. Ah, okay. So yeah. to us, it is very important to start the discussion by 
what the colonizer thinks is the beginning on the 1500s on the coast of Brazil. So we, we thought about artists on this area. Right. So then we invited Glicera Tupinambá, Olinda Tupinambá, and Ziel Carapotó. They are all from different communities and regions, and they have their own stories and contexts in the um, indigenous history and arts and activism and education and many things they've been articulating. But there's a shared materiality, it seems to me, that, that's really crucial. So, yes, you're right, there are huge differences in, in terms of the individual works. But one of the things that I think really makes this an effective pavilion is that there's a material communication, if you like, between the individual artworks which nets it together and netting is, is very much the yes. sort of thing we're looking at, mm -hmm. this language of threading and netting which unites the elements of the pavilion. Exactly. The name of the exhibition is Capoeira. Mm. Capoeira is a popular word for uh, this dance and the fight. Yeah, it's a martial yeah. art that's famous in, in Europe as, exactly. a, as a martial art, right? Yes, but this word was appropriated by the Africans in, in Brazil and the word actually comes from uh, indigenous context, from the Tupinambá language and it has two meanings. It is a bird, a bird that doesn't fly, he only walks and this bird, capoeira, he has a strategy of camouflage. So that's the way he survives. He's always camouflating in the, in the trees. And the other meaning is the forest is a technique to harvest and plant. But if you don't have the knowledge, when you look on this kind of uh, land, you think, oh, okay, it's just, you can't do anything on this land. Right. But if you have the, the knowledge, you can, you can understand that the capoeira is the best place to plant and regenerate. It's a place full of life, even though it doesn't look like that. Right. So to us, those are two big meanings to work as strategies. That's one of the ways that indigenous people resist on time. Like, because it's not about fighting with colonization, but how do we still here after so many years and how do our cultures survive and how our languages and our, our relations in this net, this network you've mentioned. So capoeira is, is a strategy of resisting. And when we look at the fishnets that we have here mm. on Glicera's work, for example, she understood that the big fishnet we have on this side it's the same way to thread the, the mantles, the cloaks. Right. So for the Tupinamba people, it took almost 400 years for them to repeat doing the cloaks, the mantles. But it's not about rescuing culture, but uh, Griseria says that that's, the knowledge was in the territory. Right. It was with the elder people. And one of the projects here was about connecting the masters, the older people, with the, the group called Atan, Atan Tupinambá, which were the filmmakers, but they were uh, doing these encounters right. uh, with the masters to learn like the techniques to do the netting and to realize, okay, we can see that our 11 mantles, 11 ancestors from our culture spread it all over Europe, but we have all the knowledge here so we can keep doing this. It's not about mimicizing or repeating, but it's uh, in a community way interacting with the territory. And the capoeira is a kind of metaphor as well, right? So one of the things that is really striking is there's no bitterness. Do you know what I mean? This could be the angriest pavilion in the whole Biennale with some justification, but it's not. The spirit of capoeira is, is about regenerating and hope for future, and that seems hugely yeah. important. This, but also the camouflage aspect. Yes. So maybe the, the angry part, maybe you could see on the, on the camouflage. So on, on Ziel Carapotal work, he presented two show. It's like a lot of fishes uh, together, yeah. swimming together. Mm -hmm. But one show is with maracas, which is a big symbol for indigenous people to resist. It's how we, we sing. It's about our happiness, our strength, our spirituality, but also is the element. And this is very literal. Some people, they die with the maraca in hand, right. resisting with the territory. So we are discussing a lot in Capoeira about territory and land and how those artists recognize this uh, on their practices as well. Right. Because none of the artists, they are only dedicated to art itself. They're all in many different roles, like right. education. Glicera is also a teacher. 
and she's a, a leadership on her community. Right. Ziel is involved with activism. Olinda Tupinamba, she has a project of reforestation on her territory. So they are all doing like many different activities, but uh, they use art as a tool to um, socialize what are the presence of indigenous people these days. Right. But just to finish about the Ziel Karapotó work, he, he presents like this show of uh, maracas in a show of bullets in this encounter. And he's not talking only about the historical aspects on the 1500s with this discussion of invasion or discovery, but he's talking about the present and especially with the name of the Biennale, Strangers uh, Everywhere. That's not a metaphor for indigenous people in Brazil because uh, we're a stranger in our own lands. Yeah. We're still struggling with the lands and the right of lands. Many of us has already like a, a land, like my on the Wapishana, we have like our, our land, but many people from the coast, they're still struggling and fighting, and for sure the pavilion brings the aspect of the denounce, but it's a, in a sensitive way. I wanted to ask about art as a practice of everyday life, in a way. You talked about how the artists are not just artists, but it seems to me that it's absolutely really crucial that you're talking about the mantle ceremony. There are films which show people working, people at work, people existing within the community. There's depictions of terrible uh, environmental atrocity alongside images of food, which of course have huge importance in terms of how food is directly connected to colonialism. So there's a means of addressing major issues, but also linking art and everyday life in a really kind of crucial and central way, it seems to me. I think like when we start speaking about this topic, we like to remember that art, for example, the, this word, it doesn't exist right. actually for, for indigenous yeah. people. We have different, like, it, it's the same discussion as Han Han Pua, because if Brazil is a nickname, what is art for indigenous people? We have many words to relate to these manual relations, or because it, usually it's about a family relation. That's how you learn like a technique. That's how you learn how to do a net, like in, in the pavilion. That's how you learn to understand what the seed you should put inside a maraca, for example. You learn when you are, of course, in the in the territories mm -hmm. and exchanging and just living. Right. Right. But yeah, for our people, for example, I, I heard someone expressing that we have a word tuminker and this word is about creation. But it's not like a manual creation. It's this creation of of life, even touching our origins of humanity and why we are here. So for us the same word of, of our origin can be this word for art if we think it, it's tuminker for the Wapishana, for example. And Gustavo, we're talking in English, which I know is not unproblematic, and it sort of tells us something about the relationship between colonialism and indigenous peoples. Yes, for me it's important to communicate that in Brazil, people usually don't think that indigenous people speak in English. And some people sometimes say, OK, so that indigenous person speaks in English, how smart he is. For us, in the up north, in Roraima, we are in the border between Guyana and Brazil. So the Wapixana people speak in English and Portuguese, but our people is also divided by the language. So even in the same territory, some people speak in English and some speak in Portuguese. So colonialism is very present, even in, inside our communities, because the history is, is there and the, the origin of these people. And at some point, people needed to choose if they go to Guyana or if they go to Brazil. And this somehow separated uh, families, even people from the same family, a brother and a sister that chose to be in different countries. Today, they speak different languages, but we still have Wapishana in, in common. So I think it's all about this uh, break the barriers and the frontiers and keep moving. That's really fascinating. Gustavo, thank you so much. Yes, thank you so much.
Almost at the furthest extreme of the sprawling Arsenale complex is the Chile Pavilion. For the exhibition Cosmo Nación, the artist Valeria Monticolque has put together a mixed media presentation that reflects on her diasporic identity because she was born in Stockholm in 1978 to Chilean parents and is therefore the first artist to represent the country at the Biennale to be born outside it. I met Valeria in the exhibition. Valeria, we're standing in your pavilion now. Right behind you is this enormous construction, a Mamita Montaña. Can you say something about what Mamita Montaña represents? Uh, Mamita Montaña represents, uh, for me, the place uh, where you feel home and you have uh, several places that are your home. Mm -hmm. Okay, so that's important because of your diasporic identity. Tell us a bit about that. So you're, you're based in Sweden, but your parents left Chile at that moment when... Pinochet had taken power and lots of people were threatened. Yes, that's right. My family came in the 70s uh, and I was born in, in Sweden. I was raised in a place with a lot of Chilean. And Tell us more about how much your background was built around mm. Chilean culture and Chilean traditions. Yeah. My both parents' culture is around me every day, and, mm. but I'm a mix from the Swedish and the Chilean. So mm. many, many years when I was younger, I didn't feel like Swedish. I felt like Chilean. Or when I went to Chile, I didn't feel Chilean. So for me, it's been very important to get rid of this feeling when you are not belonging. Right. So that's what this is about. Yeah. In Chile, you have the Cordillera, Los Andes, yeah. always around and and for me, it's like you are embraced with the, the mountain always. For me, it represents like you have your family close. Mm. And uh, I wanted to feel uh, them close. So I work a lot with the mountain. So that was us talking about them when you don't feel welcome or belong or different. Or I don't want to give this to my children and I want to get away from that. And well, the mountain... But it's a, a lot of memories. Yes. Yeah, I carry the memories of my parents, but the emptiness that can come from having to leave your home. And it's a lot of dreams for the future. And um, so it's a lot of the rainbow is always present and the horizon. For me, the horizon here, it's like the Swedish birds, it's the clouds. And then this is the mountain, the La Cordilleras, and the line of the... Um, Horizont is the generation uh, that is born in the new place. So right. that's me and all the... So there are symbols yeah. that represent yeah. you and others who are part of that diaspora, in yes, other words. Yes, yes. So you can see I use a lot of things from the homes, like a carpet, a blanket, a plate, a spoon, everything. Mm-hmm. So it... Uh, symbol is uh, for me this is my home i think uh, it's important to be allowed to to have my home where i am sometimes the society makes you feel that you're not welcome or this so it's very important so i i use all this uh, to symbolize this is my home it's the city meeting the nature too so i was in the um, forest out in the countryside and we had a picnic uh, one day it was so beautiful moment and I was from, ah, this is my earth and I wanted to bring this feeling to the city. So I did this uh, character that she has uh, used blankets and she is the picnic so she can open it in the city or where she goes she, she put it and invite people to be. So is it in a way about in some way making physical your memories and the things which trigger a relationship with your past and your and your heritage and your ancestry and so on. It's things that allow you a space to create a home within this environment that you're part of. Yes, I think so. But it's, it's the future too. Right. It's like I want to change things and for coming generations too, I, I think it's important. So... So they can feel like they are rooted. Right, yeah. So they're rooted but of multiple cultures. Yeah. Because it seems to me it's very much, of course, about Chilean diaspora. But is it also about the diasporas that you see around you in Sweden? Yeah. A place where there are multiple communities from different parts of the world and you feel part of that as well? Yes, as, yes, yeah. yes. You see, I think um, all people that come to another place that have another culture have this feeling. I think it's 
something is not only for me as being Chilean. Right. And there are lots of small sculptures mm-hmm. around us as well. What do the small sculptures represent? For me, I do the, um, this performance. Uh, is the, you can see that in the film too. Yes, yeah. Well, this is like the... El Prado, the field, right. and he is a flower too. He has flowers growing out of his head and he's clutching a flower. Yeah. He's this sort of grey figure with his face sunken into his coat and he's kneeling. He seems sort of strong but very vulnerable at the same time. That's yeah. partly the material. Yeah. That's partly yeah. what he's yeah. made of. Yeah, He can grow without having the soil and mm-hmm. he will become this beautiful flower. Uh-huh. And she is somebody that her feelings is very she's happy she's uh, sad she's angry she represents all the emotions yeah, in some yeah. Way. yeah. she's cradling a bird yeah when i first saw it i thought is the bird alive or is it dead is she tending to it because it is wounded or yes it's kind of wounded it's true so and in the back side this is death here and right. life but she has to care for it so yeah. it can be... It can recover. Yes. Now, there's another sculpture that you particularly wanted to show me. Why is this such an important one to you? Yeah, she's important because um, I call her the Svarta Vilda Molnet. It's the dark, wild cloud. OK. And she represents uh, how people can stereotype other persons from uh, judging them and not knowing who they are. So yeah. this little man, he's very well dressed, mm-hmm. but other people maybe will see this wild, uh, dark, uh, savage. But she carries this baby, that is this rainbow baby. So in the end, our children are like our treasures. <laughs> right, yeah. So, yeah. so in other words, she's a protective spirit in yeah. a way. Yeah. And effectively what you're saying is that we're too quick to judge yeah. people on appearances yeah. and we don't know anything about their emotional lives. Yeah. Or, yeah. Yeah. I think uh, the kids are very judge that uh, in Sweden... It's happened a lot of violence, but they judge all, and they feel like this, that uh, they are judged. And I think they have to have an opportunity to grow and have image of themselves different. And it's about not being racist to people that only maybe because they come from certain culture or nation. Mm. And I want to make her, like, holy Right. So a lot of this I'm struck by, and I think the overwhelming feeling when you went in, into this room is, is that it's about the imagination mm. somehow. Everything around us, whether it's on film and sculpture, on the wall piece or the Mamita Montaña, mm-hmm. it all seems to be about you allowing your imagination to respond to your condition, to, to who you are and where you are. Mm. Yes. I think each person can have the story when they come in and... And maybe they can understand me or people that have this diaspora. It's a lot of feelings that I want to represent. And the characters, they are often, they can transform. For me, it's, it's a way of make a difference or change my feeling if I can make a change. Well, Valeria, thank you very much. Thank you. Like the international exhibition, all the pavilions at the Biennale open tomorrow, the 20th of April, and continue until the 24th of November. And you can read reviews, news and features about all aspects of the Biennale at theartnewspaper.com. And finally, it's time for this episode's Work of the Week. In 1516, the greatest of Venetian painters, Titian, was commissioned to make an altarpiece for the Basilica of Santa Maria Gloriosa di Frari, the biggest of all Venice's churches in the San Polo district at the heart of the city. He produced a painting that is, quite simply, one of the greatest ever made. A source of inspiration and amazement for artists from the 16th century to today, the Assumption of the Virgin, or the Assunta, which was completed in just two years in 1518. During the two previous Biennales, the Asanta has been behind a scaffold as it was undergoing conservation treatment supported by Save Venice, the leading US non-profit organisation dedicated to preserving Venice's artistic heritage. But it was revealed in its freshly conserved glory in late 2022. Early on Tuesday morning, I went to the Ferrari to talk to the man who was responsible for this much-needed restoration, Giulio Bonna. Giulio, Titian made this painting between 1516 and 1518. What was his reputation at the time? Had he by then become 
Venice's most renowned painter. In 1516, Titian was a young emerging artist. We have no documented sources about his fame at that time, but it's very possible that the death of Giovanni Bellini, the most celebrated painter in the city, he found himself in a very advantaged position. And also the premature death in 1510 of his mentor, Giorgione de Castelfranco, and the departure of Sebastiano del Piombo to Rome mm. in 1511 offered him the opportunity to flourish. What do we know about this commission for this work? Mm. Who commissioned it? And do you know how precise that commission was? Because sometimes those commissions can be very precise in mm. terms of what they want yes. the artist to achieve. Yes, we are here in the front of the painting and the frame, and the answer to this question is carved into the pillars. Ah that support the two columns of the stone frame in which the Assunta is contained. Here, there are two gilded inscriptions mm -hmm. in Latin. In the inscription on the right, we read, Frater Germanus Ancaram Erigi Curavit MDXVI, which means Brother Germanus commissioned the construction of this altar in 1516. Germano da Casale, prior of the Frari from 1513, was therefore the patron. Right, okay. In the scroll in the left, we read Assumte Coelum Eterni Opificis Matri, which means the altar was erected for the Virgin Mother of the Eternal, assumed into heaven exactly what the painting represents. How lovely. And it really is an astonishing and dramatic representation of the assumption, isn't it? It's one of the most dramatic compositions I think I've ever seen in the sense that it's so dynamic. We have this triangle and then a circle. What's really interesting to me is how innovative was that treatment? Is it right that it was shocking to the friars who commissioned it? Yes. Information about this comes to us from what Ludovico Dolce wrote and published in 1557 in the Dialogo della Pittura, Dialogo on Painting. Mm -hmm. Dolce recalls how not only the brothers, but also the Venetian painters and the public were, at the beginning, very disappointed with the painting. Dolce also clarifies the reason of this shock caused by the Assunta on the people who had previously seen nothing but, quote, dead and cold things of Gentile and Giovanni Bellini or Vivarini. It's very unkind to Bellini, isn't yes. it? <laughs> we have a really beautiful Bellini just next to us here. So, and, and, and it's not dead and cold, it's just very serene and, and calm compared to Titian. <laughs> Can you tell us more about the innovative composition and colouring of the picture? Yeah. Ludovico Dolce helps us again to understand how revolutionary the Assunta appeared saying that it was the first important work in oil made in the city by Titian in a very short time when he was very young. And describing the painting, he says, the Virgin truly seems to ascend to heaven with a face full of humility and a cloak that flies gracefully. Above her, he depicted the Eternal Father surrounded by two angels. Below her, the apostles, larger than life, who, with different poses, show joy and amazement. They really do show their amazement. There's a figure on the right who's in this astonishing vermilion or orange colour and throws up his arms. Mm. Is that St John the Evangelist who's taken aback, who sort of recoils away on the left and St Peter sits and looks up. So you have this amazing animation in the Apostles, don't you? The composition is incredibly dynamic. Never was seen before like this, in these dimensions. And you're right that the Virgin herself appears to be amazed 
by what she's experiencing as she is lifted on this cloud. So she has an astonishing look on her face. So it must have been amazing to see that really up close. Yes, fantastic. One of the things that I'm noticing sitting here is that the figures are very large, which was the source of much commentary from the people who commissioned the painting. And that's because Titian is thinking about the entire space of the Ferrari. So he's thinking about the experience. He's thinking much more about how it's going to be seen. Is that right? Mm. Yes. The Assunta was created at the end of the third reconstruction of the the church when the presbytery and the entire building reached the imposing dimensions in which we find ourselves today. The church is a space nearly 100 meters long and 40 meters wide. The presbytery itself is 20 meters deep, 14 wide and 25 meters high. So Germano de Casale and Titian imagine, design and create indeed an imposing work of art for this immense space. The painting is placed in a stone frame in a shape of a triumphal arch immediately visible from the entrance mm. and which perfectly framed by the choir arch will become forever the new focal point of the entire building. You see it the minute you walk in, don't you? Yes. That's the thing. It, it attracts you the moment you come in. Yes, it's very magnetic. <laughs> it, it really is magnetic, yeah. Um, the presbytery, oriented to west, is pierced by immense window from which a very strong light permeates during the afternoon. It was the ideal context to relieve the event of the Assumption of the Virgin that took place, as the sources tell, in a triumph of light. Titian, in charge of performing this miracle, therefore puts his hand in a place of capital importance on a project that, for his dimensional daring, alone represented a challenge to all previous traditions in the field of altar decoration. So Titian basically, in a way had to fight the light that was around because there's such strong light coming in that he has to make the painting radiate yes. in its own way. Yes, this is true. But also he played, we think, with this incredibly uh, strong backlight mm. to make more miraculous the vision of the painting. How amazing. Now, let's talk about your conservation of this painting. Why did it need treatment, first off? Regarding the painting, the problems were related to heavy dust deposit, widespread small lifting on the paint film caused by material applied during previous treatment and woodworm attack affecting the wooden support. Other serious problems were instead related to the present of an imposing organ which was erected behind the painting on 1928 and the organ was physically attached to the back of the painting <laughs> through, yes, by means of struts and brackets. Right. Metal, How astonishing. It. <laughs> yes. it was an extraordinary decision to make to attach yeah. an organ in the 20th century to one of the greatest Renaissance paintings. And it's on 22 wooden panels. Yes, there right? are uh, actually there are 20. So 20 wooden panels. Yeah. What does that mean in terms of its conservation? Is it more vulnerable than canvas or less? <laughs> Incredibly is not so vulnerable. Mm. Uh, the excellent quality of the wood used for the support, the method of assembling the boards, and the simple and effective uh, original cradle, which has been untouched during the century and still function, uh, have made this work very resilient if compared to a painting on canvas of the same size. And tell me, does Venice and its humidity and the air here, we're in the middle of the sea, effectively. Does that make it difficult to look after paintings? Does it make this painting more vulnerable because it's in Venice as opposed to, say, Rome? Yes, Venice is not an easy environment for paintings. And in general, high humidity levels can be the cause of damage to work of art. Regarding the Assunta, however, we discovered during the conservation treatment and the monitoring that the microclimate of the presbytery with an average relative humidity rate of around 17% with peaks of 85% but with drop 
that hardly fall below 40% were and are factor favorable to this conservation. Ah, okay. So, so the humidity actually helps it remain yeah. in a good state. Yes. In fact, the high humidity has, in fact, limited the phenomena of shrinkage of the wood over time and the consequent problems of cracking or detachment between the board with positive effect also on the conservation of the pain layers. Okay. Now, you're an experienced conservator, but you are faced with restoring one of the greatest paintings ever made. Were you nervous even despite your experience? Yes. <laughs> <laughs> but with the time I learned to deal with this and we were supported during all the conservation treatment that took four years by the direction of the work mm. and by colleagues who were supporting us with uh, investigations and many things that we needed during the, the process. So tell us, what was it like? Being that close because you're on a scaffold, you know, inches away, touching the work itself. Yeah. What was it like to be that? Yes, yeah, incredible, to... exciting. And during the four years of the treatment, uh, every day was enriched with some discover right. regarding the teaching execution and the modus operandi. And to share this amazing experience, we are creating a website mm. where it will be possible soon to get closer to the details of the painting with high definition images and to have information about the materiality of the painting and the treatment that we performed. As we said, it was designed to be seen from a distance. Up close, do you really see how large Titian's brush marks are, for instance? Did it look like he was painting it to be seen from a distance rather than up close? Yes, yes. The painting was painted to be seen from a distance, but also from bottom to top. Oh, yeah. The brush strokes and the pictorial ductus are therefore executed in more defined way for the figures in the foreground compared to those further back but also for the figures of the apostles below compared to those of the Virgin and even more so the Eternal Father and the angels, the putti and the head of the cherubs on the upper part of the painting. So there's more brevity the further up the picture you yes, get. Yes, yes. Was there anything unexpected? I mean, obviously you would have done a lot of study before you began the conservation, but did you learn anything as you were going? Yes. Much information about the execution technique uh, is known from the treatment and investigation made in the 1970. However, we discover much, much more. We discover, for example, that the painting was created on site and not elsewhere as sources recall. So Titian painted it in the Ferrari? Yes, exactly. We have material evidence of that. Amazing. We have added a lot of knowledge regarding the underdrawing, which is very complex mm. and executed in three successive uh, phases. The first phase was carried out with the help of transposition system. So cartoons, in other words? Yes. Yeah. And two subsequent phases carried out freehand directly on the ground with the brush in a liquid medium and also with a dry charcoal. Uh, we discovered that the pictorial layers are executed in a mixed technique with tempera bases and oil finishes. We discovered that at the end of the painting process, Titian returned to the painting, intensifying the chiaroscuro, light and like shadow. shadow. Yeah, yeah. And finally, perhaps, the painting was not originally varnished. Ah, so when you say it's not originally varnished, the colours would have been absolutely raw. And it, it, yeah. So do you think that was because Titian wanted that, that again, that he's fighting this light, he's creating yeah. this luminous yeah. painting, and he needed the colours to sing as much as they possibly could, so in yes. other words, without varnish. Yes. That's really interesting. So lastly, what's the ultimate effect of your conservation project? What's different about the painting to how somebody would have experienced it five years ago before it began? Mm. Uh, within the conservation project, the organ was removed yeah. and the wooden support was secured and treated against the woodworms. The stone frame was cleaned from the deposits of dirt and candle smoke. Mm -hmm. Today, the, the frame appears bright and vibrant mm -hmm. due to the presence of gilded decoration and the phytomorphic inner frame with the azurite background. Oh, yes, yeah. The two putti in the spandlers 
are legible and the status above the entablature are more visible. Right. With the treatment also, the paint layers has been fixed and the surface cleaned. The painting recovered a clearer appearance, of course, and a three-dimensional and vibrational depth. That's right. It sings again. It's as radiant yeah. as Titian intended it it's, once yes, again. It's glowing. But above all, it brought back to an appropriate conservative and safety condition necessary for years to come. Thank you, Julia. Thank you. The website that Julio mentioned, which will present the findings of the conservation of the Asunta in detail, will go online later this year. I've seen a sneak preview of the images that will feature, and they are astonishing. You can find out more about Save Venice at savevenice.org. And that's it for this episode. We're on Twitter at Tan Audio and on Facebook and Instagram, of course. The Week in Art is produced by Julia Mahalska, Alexander Morrison and David Clack. And David also does the editing and sound design. Thanks also to Daniela Hathaway and to this week's guests, Louisa and Jane, Jeffrey John, Romuald, Gustavo, Valeria and Julio. Special thanks to Melissa Conn at Save Venice. Thank you for listening. We'll see you next week. Bye for now.